Okay, the recording has started um, February 25th, 2021. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Gulabdara with Legacies of War and welcome today to our special edition of Legacies Library. So Legacies Library is a brand new initiative uh, created as a response to the lack of awareness and contents on the secret war in Laos, as well as the broader Vietnam War era conflict and damage in Cambodia and Vietnam. This initiative will serve as a repository of information in the forms of books, blogs, vlogs, and oral history to be shared, especially with young people, students, and the broader public free of charge. Throughout the year, we'll, have, um, we'll host book talks uh, with authors, film screenings, followed by discussions with the directors and other topic matter experts. Funds raised through our Legacies Library will allow us to purchase books and other related materials, as well as allocate time um, to develop our own educational content. We also hope this will inspire a new generation of researchers, authors, and activists who care about our mission and the lasting impacts of the legacies of war, like my esteemed guest today, Professor Noam Chomsky. Before I introduce um, Professor Chomsky, I wanted to also share um, that at the core of Legacy's own work is our advocacy efforts, um, pushing for US funds to be allocated towards the clearance of UXO and survivor assistance in Laos. Of the $40 million that's allocated, um, that's allocated through Congress, the funds go directly to fuel the work on the ground, not to Legacies of War. We operate on a tiny shoestring budget of under 350,000 a year. We have two staff and 16 board members who really are working board members. Now, this month has been particularly difficult for all of us here at Legacies, as we are tragically reminded of how urgent our work is due to three horrific events that occurred from bombs dropped five decades ago. I'll share more during our Q&A portion. I just wanted to reiterate why it is so important for this talk to happen and for other conversations around our mission and our shared history to be more widely shared um, and communicated, uh, such as this Legacies Library um, event today. So thank you all so much for tuning in and I'm honored to welcome Professor Noam Chomsky. Um, although you need no uh, introduction, I just wanna say a few words to share with our audience tuning in. Um, considered to be the founder of modern linguistics and, and is one of the most cited scholars in modern history, Professor Noam Chomsky has transformed the field of linguistics, influenced fields such as cognitive science, philosophy, psychology, computer science, childhood education, and anthropology. He is Institute Professor Emeritus at MIT, where he worked for 50 years, for more than 50 years. Professor Chomsky is also one of the most influential public intellectuals and activists in the world. He has written over 100 books, including um, the one that he contributed to, The United States, Southeast Asia, and Historical Memory, which we will be talking about today. Um, and I also want to share uh, my favorite, At War with Asia. So welcome, Professor. <laughs> um, so before we, um, we kind of get started to some of the deeper questions, um, I wanted to ask you, um, if you will, um, to explain to our viewers um, the US's interest and involvement in Southeast Asia, uh, which started prior to the Vietnam War era. Can you give an overview of those tuning in who may not be familiar with that time period in our world? Um, why did U.S. leaders care so much about the region and why the enormous expenditures on a few small, quote, third world countries? The, during the second, before the Second World War, the United States was far and away the richest country in the world, had been for a long time, but it was not a major player in the world scene. It, of course, intervened all over the place, but uh, mostly in the Western Hemisphere. Some forays elsewhere, but not much. The major global power was England, uh, secondly, France, then some others. 
but the United States was not the major player. When the Second World War started in 1939, uh, planners in the United States, State Department, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, major non-governmental foreign policy organization, began to meet uh, what were called the War Peace Studies Program to think about the nature of the uh, world that would emerge from the Second World War. Uh, they took for granted that it would be a very different world. The United States would be dominant. Uh, uh, that prediction was, of course, correct. Uh, most of the rest of the industrial world was devastated, destroyed. Uh, the United States actually gained from the war. It was immune from the war. Uh, uh, but uh, um, industrial production quadrupled, and ended the depression. Uh, the United States emerged with uh, an overwhelming proportion of the wealth of the world, maybe almost as much as half. Uh, but anyway, enormous military uh, mm -hmm. supremacy, uh, mass security, and so on. And uh, they understood the US would be largely managing the world, very different from the past. Now, in the early years of the war, they assumed that uh, Germany would promptly, probably emerge victorious in Europe. So there would be a German controlled world and an American controlled world. The American controlled world they assumed would include, of course, Latin America, uh, but also uh, the former British Empire, which the US would essentially take over, that includes the crucial Middle East region uh, and Asia. They would be part of the, China was then, uh, a, the, the official government of China was basically a US client government. They assumed China would be part of it. That's why China's in the United Nations because in those days it was a US client state. But uh, uh, the, as the war moved on, by 1942, 1943, it was realized that the Russians would defeat Germany. Uh, the United States and Britain were kind of at the periphery of this fight. Uh, so the picture changed and uh, the area that the US would control was extended to include the industrial areas of Europe, Western, Western Europe, uh, as much of Eurasia as possible. Uh, then plans were developed, which after the war were implemented, carefully implemented. Uh, the idea was that each area of the world would receive what was called its function. Uh, the function of Southeast Asia uh, was to provide uh, raw materials and resources to the former colonial powers to enable them to reconstruct, and of course, to the United States. A function of Latin America was to be a service area for the United States, source of resources, raw materials, and markets. Uh, the Middle East uh, would be incorporated within the US system. It was described as uh, the strategically most important area of the world, uh, uh, a material prize without comparability, talking about the great oil resources. Uh, Africa. The, uh, the plan, chief planner was George Kennan. He was writing the documents I'm quoting from. He said, Africa, we're not much interested in. So we can hand it over to Europe to exploit his word for its reconstruction. Uh, that's the relation between Europe and Africa. Well, that was the world. Now, the US had somewhat conflicting concerns. Uh, it wanted to end all of the imperial preference systems. There had been before the war a British system, a French system, a Dutch system, which were kind of closed, run by the imperial power. You always want to end all of those. It wanted free access to the entire world for US corporations for investment and resource extraction. It was given prettier rhetoric, but that's what it amounted to. So the US was opposed to imperial preference systems, but that conflicted with another goal, 
to help the European powers reconstruct as clients of the United States, as subordinate to the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, for them to reconstruct meant basically controlling their former colonies. So there was a conflict. With regard to Southeast Asia, conflict was very clear. Should the United, there were rising nationalist anti-colonial movements all over Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Should the United States support them to break out of the imperial preference system or should the United States oppose them to support the former colonial powers? That was a conflict. And through the late 1940s, there was much debate about it. Actually, we know a lot about this because rich internal records have appeared partly from the Pentagon Papers, partly from other sources. Uh, so there was a lot of debate about it in the 40s and the US made different decisions in different cases, depending on circumstances. Now, with regard to Indochina, uh, Ho Chi Minh had, and the Viet Minh had basically taken it over and they were appealing for US support. They wanted to be, they were doing pretty much everything they could to get US support in their struggle against France. France was trying to reconquer the former colony. And the US was ambivalent up until 1949. 1949, an event occurred, which is called in the United States, the loss of China. Mm. Very interesting phrase. Uh, I can lose my computer, I can't lose your computer. But the assumption, the tacit assumption is we own the world. Mm. And if China became independent, we lost China. Uh, that became a major issue in US politics. Who was responsible for the loss of China? A large part of the source of what's called McCarthyism. But US policy changed at that point, decided with the loss of China, we have to help France reconquer its former colony. So the US began to support the French war against Vietnam and all of Indochina, in fact, was Laos and Cambodia as well. Uh, the US provided about 80% of France's arms and it moved to the point of even threatening maybe a nuclear war if it couldn't suppress the Vietnamese resistance. Uh, mm -hmm. Finally, France couldn't handle it anymore, pulled out. There was an international conference at Geneva mm -hmm. to settle the affairs of Indochina. The US regarded it as a disaster refused to accept it. The agreement called for unification of Vietnam with elections under international supervision. The United States absolutely wouldn't tolerate that. It was taken for granted that the Viet Minh, Ho Chi Minh <laughs> nationalist movement would overwhelmingly win the election. So no election. Uh, the US insisted on breaking Vietnam into two parts where the South would be run by the United States. The United States installed a client government. Uh, the North Vietnamese sort of accepted that. They were willing, even the cancellation of the election, they accepted they had a lot to do just to rebuild their own country. Right. Uh, meanwhile, the Southern, in the Southern area, the regime that the United States imposed was very repressive and harsh. Uh, and resistance began to develop to it. The North Vietnamese didn't want to get involved. They were had their own problems. Uh, but finally, the resistance reached such a point that it appealed to the North Vietnamese for some support and they gave limited support. They, there were many South Vietnamese who had relocated to the North after the war. So they allowed them to return to assist in the resistance against uh, the US imposed regime. That was what the US called infiltration from the North, invasion from the North. Uh, the uh, maybe 70, 60, 70,000 South Vietnamese were killed during this period, it wasn't peaceful time. Well, by about 1960, uh, the South Vietnamese client state couldn't handle the resistance. The resistance was the National Liberation Front in US propaganda, it's called the Viet Cong, it's a US propaganda term, it was the National Liberation Front of 
Vietnam, and they had a program. Their program was calling for the neutralization of South Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Mm -hmm. So it would be a neutral region in Indochina. North, North Vietnam would be governed by the Viet Minh. Uh, US would absolutely not accept that. Uh, one of the US goal was to take over all of Vietnam and to control Laos and Cambodia. John F. Kennedy came into office. He immediately escalated the war sharply, 1961, uh, 1962, authorized the US Air Force for the first time to start bombing South Vietnam. That meant bombing the rural areas where most of the population was and where the resistance was based. Uh, they used South Vietnamese markings on the planes, but nobody was fooled. Uh, the, uh, he authorized uh, chemical warfare, extensive chemical warfare to destroy crops and livestock to try to drive the peasant population into what amounted to concentration camps called strategic hamlets, but essentially drive the population into these areas, uh, controlled, uh, and, uh, surrounded by barbed wire, controlled by force. Uh, the US intelligence knew perfectly well and reported that they were supporting the resistance. There was mm -hmm. no doubt about that. US intelligence argued that the National Liberation Front is what they call the Viet Cong, is fighting a political war. But we cannot fight a political war because they have the population on their side. So we must fight a military war. That was the US position. Kennedy started bombing, started chemical warfare, established these programs where the rural population was driven into these so-called protected areas, basically concentration camps, authorized napalm, no opposition in the United States. It was almost impossible, I was getting involved myself at that time, almost impossible to arouse any opposition. Mm -hmm. Finally, the war continued. There's a mythology in the United States, including on the left, that Kennedy was planning to leave. It's totally false. He was one of the most super hawks in his administration. Mm -hmm. He looked at the documents, he said, yes, we should get out, but only after victory, always, to the day of his assassination. First victory, then we can get out. Mm -hmm. Well, they couldn't get victory after the assassination. War went on, escalated, more American, more American troops. U.S. started bombing North <laughs> Vietnam, actually started early bombing of Laos and Cambodia, lesser level. By 1967, uh, it was fine. There was finally a large scale political opposition in the United States. Uh, but by that time, it's worth remembering South Vietnam had almost been destroyed. Uh, the leading specialist on the topic, Bernard Fall, highly respected in the even in the US government, he's the one specialist they included in their uh, uh, reports and so on. He's a military historian, Vietnam specialist, a hawk. Mm -hmm. He thought the Saigon government ought to run all of Vietnam, but he cared about the Vietnamese people. Uh, in 1967, he was killed in, in, uh, in observing a battle. His last article, a book called Last Reflections on the War, said that he doubted that Vietnam could survive as a cultural and historical energy entity under the attack of the worst uh, military, the most strong military force ever leveled against an area this size. Mm -hmm. uh, but the war continued. Now, finally, it ended up with a peace settlement. Uh, um, come back to that. It's in the United States. It is almost universally described as a failure. The war was a failure, left to right. That's what everyone says. How do you decide whether an enterprise is a failure? Well, you ask what the goals were, and you ask whether they were attained. So therefore, let's look back at the goals. We have, as I said, a very intense, extreme, extraordinary record. 
-hmm. There was a reason for the US to take over the French war and then to refuse the settlement. It was afraid that, uh, to borrow Henry Kissinger's later terms, that a unified independent Vietnam would be a virus that would spread contagion over the region. Mm -hmm. Other formulations, Dean Acheson, one of the top planners, uh, Indochina, free and independent of China would be a rotten apple, which would spoil the barrel. Others called it the domino theory. It's all the same. Mm -hmm. It says if there is successful independent development somewhere, it'll, even if we don't care about that country, it'll spread the idea elsewhere. Others in similar conditions will pick it up. Pretty soon the system of control will erode and in, in, in Southeast Asia, they didn't care that much about Vietnam, but they did care about Indonesia. It's a major country, huge resources. Mm -hmm. And they were afraid the contagion must might reach to Indonesia. At that point, it would even affect Japan. Japan was called the super domino by the leading American Southeast Asia historian, John Dower. And the idea was Japan would accommodate itself to an independent Southeast Asia, become its technological industrial center. The rest would be its resource area. That would mean that the United States had lost World War II. Mm -hmm. World War II in the Pacific was fought to prevent Japan from doing this. And in 1950, US planners were not prepared to lose World War II for obvious reasons. So they had very strong reasons that they didn't care that much about Indochina, very strong reasons to prevent successful independent development there. And that was the goal of the Indochina war. Well, how do you deal with that problem? You have a virus, you wanna spread contagion. What you do is destroy the virus, inoculate the potential victims, just like we're doing now, okay? How do you inoculate the potential victims? You install vicious, brutal military dictatorships. And that's exactly what was done. So in the early, uh, this is the late 40s, early 50s, installed dictatorships throughout the region. Thailand, uh, Burma, the Burmese dictatorship, which still exists, was a kind of byproduct of this. Uh, other countries, the worst, the most concerned was Indonesia. In 1958, uh, Eisenhower uh, tried to uh, incite a military coup in Indonesia to strip off the outer islands, which have all the resources. It failed, but the operations continued. They finally succeeded in 1965. There was a military coup, brutal, murderous military coup, killed hundreds of thousands of people, uh, destroyed the main political party, the left party, Mm -hmm. party of the poor, basically, that was wiped out. Uh, it was well described in the US press. The New York Times described it as a staggering mass slaughter. Uh, Time magazine devoted a whole issue to a boiling blood bloodbath describing the horrors in detail mm -hmm. with praise, euphoria. In the New York Times, the leading liberal columnist, James Reston called it a, a gleam of light in Asia hope where there once was none. Finally, we've succeeded in taking over Indonesia, mass, staggering mass slaughter, boiling bloodbath, destroy the political system. It's magnificent, a gleam of light in Asia. Uh, McGeorge Bundy, who was, and there was a reason. It meant the Vietnam War had been won. It was not going to infect the re region. Later, McGeorge Bundy, who was in the national security advisor for Kennedy and Johnson. He reflected later that they probably should have called off the Vietnam War in 1965 uh, because it was basically won. That's not the picture in the United States. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's so it horrific. Um, actually, it was yeah. a mixed failure. The United States did not achieve its maximal goal, didn't conquer Vietnam, so it didn't try, but it did achieve its major goals. No no falling dominoes, no contagion, all fixed under US control. Mm -hmm. Well, things have happened later that changed the world, but that was the picture then.
uh, that's uh, Laos and Cambodia were described sometimes as sideshows. They weren't sideshows from the point of view of the population. Uh, when the US uh, had been bombing Laos, northern Laos mostly, uh, there was a bombing pause when there were negotiations with North Vietnam by 1968-69, there was a brief bombing pause. The bombers had nothing to do. So they were sent to bomb Northern Laos, literally. That's testimony in Congress that Fred Branfman, great activist on this topic, dug up. Mm. So they were sent to bomb Northern Laos, plane of charge, had nothing to do with the war in Vietnam. There's a peasant area where scattered peasants, people, most of them didn't even know they were in Laos. This massive bombing took place for years. Uh, it was so horrible, people had to live in caves in order to survive, maybe get out at night to try to farm. The area is littered with cluster bombs, unexploded bombs. Cluster bombs are, are anti-civilian weapons. They're banned over most of the world. The US still uses them. Uh, they, uh, uh, a kid can be walking in the fields, a farmer can be working, there's a little thing there that looks to a child, it may look like a toy, pick it up, it explodes, sends pellets all over to kill anybody in the area. I, I, have, I have one example here. I should say that in Cambodia, the US expanded the war under Nixon, at uh, Nixon's orders to his National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger were that he wanted a major bombing attack in Cambodia. And Kissinger sent to the Air Force the following message. Massive bombing campaign in Cambodia. Anything that flies against anything that moves. I don't think in the entire archival record you can find a call for genocide like that. Try to find one anything that flies against anything that moves. Well, that was Cambodia in the early 70s, had a big effect. One of the things it did was convert the Khmer Rouge, which had been a small uh, 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 left radical organization, turned them into a massive organization with a huge peasant following. They finally came to Phnom Penh then came the Khmer Rouge atrocities. We talk about the latter part, not the former part. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I should say that after the Khmer Rouge were driven out of Cambodia by Vietnam, the US turned officially to support for the Khmer Rouge. Uh, mm -hmm. They became the official, they were given the role by the US of the government of Cambodia. They were the ones recognized at the UN uh, the U under US force and the US supported them. Well, a lot to say about all this, but that's the basic picture. Yeah. Uh, I'll just add one more thing about mm -hmm. it. At the end of the war in 1975, uh, everyone had to write a statement about the war, of course. And if you look over the spectrum, I wrote an article about it, reviewing it left to right, you basically found two views in the United States. The Hawks said, we were stabbed in the back. If we fought harder, we could have won. Just these liberals wouldn't fight anymore, so we lost the war. Mm -hmm. Go to the liberal end of the spectrum. It's more interesting. The very li liberal extreme, I suppose, is Anthony Lewis of the New York Times, militant liberal columnist, did a lot of good things. Uh, he had an article about the war, which was the following. I'll quote from it. He said the war began with blundering efforts to do good. What's the evidence for that? None. The United States did it, so it was to do good. That's an axiom. You don't have to need evidence for that. Why blundering? Because it failed from his point of view. We began with blundering efforts to do good, but by 1969, it was clear that we could not bring democracy to South Vietnam at a cost acceptable to ourselves. So it was a disaster. What's the evidence that we we're trying to bring democracy to Vietnam? Well, what we were doing was what I described, but as it gets transmuted 
through the liberal propaganda system, it's trying to bring democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the spectrum. With one exception, the population of the United States. There were studies at the same time of popular attitudes carried out by the Chicago Council of Foreign Relations, the group that does extensive studies of popular attitudes. 1979-75, they ran polls. One of the questions was, what do you think about the Vietnam War now that it's over? Answer, 70% of the population said, it's not a mistake, it was fundamentally wrong and immoral. 70%. Mm -hmm. That question kept being asked for about 15 years, always getting the same answer. Not a mistake, fundamentally wrong and immoral. That's the population. Then there's the liberal intellectual elite, a mistake, a failure. We couldn't bring democracy at a cost acceptable to ourselves. Now that's a pretty remarkable achievement of propaganda. What people actually meant, we don't know, because they were never asked, but uh, it was just left at that. But because uh, you don't ask that question. Uh, maybe they meant it was fundamentally wrong and immoral. Maybe they meant something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, uh, the effect of the war was to leave what in elite circles is called the Vietnam syndrome. Uh, this was described once by Norman Podhoretz, well-known intellectual, as the sickly inhibitions against the use of military force. The population of the United States was infected by sickly inhibitions against the use of military force. That's the Vietnam syndrome. Later years, you keep hearing uh, George Bush, others saying, we finally lift the Vietnam syndrome. They haven't. The country is still infected by these sickly inhibitions. And we saw it in later years when later presidents tried to duplicate what Kennedy had done in Vietnam, they couldn't do it. I think that's my view. That basic overview. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. There, there's so much to unpack there um, and we have a limited time. So I just want to um, go back to your time in Laos um, with Fred and, you know, too bad we're not doing this interview in Laos, but, you know, um, uh, I hope the textiles remind you a little bit of your time there. Um, so you were there with Fred. Um, can you elaborate a little bit about your time with him and what stood out most to you? Um, how did you feel about the people? What were some of the most memorable moments of your time there? Well, I was at Laos kind of by accident. Uh, during one of the bombing pauses, a few months of bombing pause, I was invited to Hanoi. Uh, I didn't actually know why, but when I got there, turned out they wanted me to lecture at the university at the ruins of the university. The people had been just scattered, hadn't heard anything for years. I just actually I spent most of the time I was there eight hours a day just lecturing on anything I knew anything about. Uh, that's the main reason they wanted me there, but I also traveled around. Well, to get to Vietnam, you had to go to Laos. There was no way to get there. You have to fly from Vientiane, capital of Laos, to uh, to Hanoi. So I went, we had two companions, the three of us, uh, uh, professor of economics at Cornell, Doug Dowd, clergyman, Dick Fernandez, all actively involved in the anti-war movement. Three of us went, they uh, did other things. Uh, when I got to Laos, we expected to take the next plane to North Vietnam. There was a corridor which was protected. There were bombers flying all over the place, but there were there was a protected corridor where a UN plane, propeller plane, could slowly make its way from Vientiane to Hanoi. Uh, the thing was run by an Indian bureaucrat. If you don't know anything about bureaucrats, they have one goal in life. That's to make life as unpleasant as possible for everyone. They're bored out of their minds, so that's the only thing to do. So the Indian bureaucrat, fortunately, wouldn't let us get on the plane. He insisted we stay in Laos for an extra week, which turned out to be a very 
wonderful thing for me. I learned something. I learned a lot. At the airport, when I got there, I was met by Fred Branfman. I, I didn't know him, but he knew that I was active in the anti-war movement. So he met me at the airport. I spent practically the whole week with him. He was an amazing person. I mean, he is personally responsible for the fact that Laos was saved from total destruction. He worked intensively to try to get information about what was, he spoke Lao uh, fluently, lived, actually lived with a Lao couple in a village somewhere. Um, he totally immersed himself in the culture, knew, knew lots of people from the government up to the resistance. And uh, he, he, and it was, I spent a lot of time with him in refugee camps, which were not being reported. The CIA had sent its mercenary army through the plain of jars and driven out tens of thousands of people who were in camps about 30 kilometers out of Vientiane and visited the camps, got in, interviewed refugees through Fred, he was translating, and uh, uh, met, uh, we able to meet all kinds of people from Sivana Puma, who was the head of the government, total clan, the government barely existed. So the first, just to give you an illustration, from Puvama, Sivana Puma down to resistors, people in the Pathet Lao, the resistance movement, who are taking R&R, &R, <laughs> as the GIs called it, uh, rest and uh, recreation, trying to get away from the war for a while. So they were underground in, in Vientiane. Fred knew a number, met some, and uh, I was able to talk to them. So quite a range. I was able to t talk to one of the government ministers uh, I quoted him on what I wrote. He didn't want to be identified. He would have been killed. But uh, I called him an urban intellectual. But he was actually a minister in the government. He was actually a rich landowner. Uh, he told me that he basically hoped that the resistance would win, even though he'd be killed and his possessions would be taken away. Because that's the only way a Laos could survive. Otherwise, it would be taken over as a Thai dependency, U.S. died. Uh, so he kind of hoped that they would win, although they were going to kill him. You know, it was a very mixed place. Just to give you an indication of what the government was like, the first day I was there, I wanted to get some information about the country. So I went to uh, the government tourism office or whatever it was called. And there was a guy sitting there reading a newspaper and I he noticed me. I came in. He talked. He said, "What he said? What do you want?" I said, "I'd like to get a map of Laos." He said, "Well, if you want a map of Laos, go to the U.S. consulate." No, we don't have things like that. <laughs> it was a total facade. It was all completely run by the U.S. In fact, by the CIA mostly. It was barely concealed. And uh, uh, Fred was able to expose uh, a bombing center, big air, U.S. air bases where flames were flying constantly, uh, destroying northern Laos, uh, devastating it. Mm -hmm. uh, this was called uh, preventing North Vietnamese infiltration. Well, some of it was bombing the so-called Ho Chi Minh Trail, but they were bombing uh, northern Laos, which had nothing to do with the war, and they, in fact, conceded that. Uh, but I learned quite a lot about Laos at the time, through mainly through Fred and his contacts. How uh, long were you there? a week, but a very intensive week, did nothing but work on this. And it was pretty interesting. So this in Vientiane, there's two big hotels only. So all foreigners are in the hotels. Um, uh, there was a lot of reporters there, mm. huge flood of reporters. The reason was all the top reporters from all over. Uh, Nixon had announced that the North Vietnamese were attacking Vientiane, that North Vietnamese tanks were on the border of Vientiane. So the whole international press corps flew in. Uh, they got their news from what were called the five o'clock follies. Mm -hmm. At five o'clock in the afternoon, you go to the American embassy and a press agent reads the news, and then you report it the next morning in the paper. 
Meanwhile, they go back to the hotel bar where most of them were hanging out, laughing at these ridiculous stories. Because it was obvious there were no North Vietnamese anywhere. Everybody knew it. But they basically reported the stories. And you get out in the morning, 6 a.m., the hotel. I went down. To, there's a bunch of guy, tall, blonde guys with hair, you know, cut, uh, sitting at a table by themselves and eating by themselves. They disappear and then they come back in the afternoon, have a drink and disappear. Everybody knew who they were. They were American mercenary pilots. Uh, nobody else like that is going to be in Vietnam, but you don't report that. Uh, you, that's just what you see. They were the pilots who then went off to the air bases and destroyed villages and peasant communities, came back, had the drink, went back. It was Air America, it was called the mercenary force. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, learned quite a lot of many things. For one thing, I got, it's in the articles, I don't know if I reported, but a lot of details about North Vietnamese infiltration. Mm -hmm. American intelligence knew there was almost nothing. Uh, there was a little bit of North Vietnamese infiltration in the North for pretty good reasons. Mm -hmm. The U.S. had station, radar stations right on the Vietnamese border in northern Laos, which were being used to direct bombing raids against North Vietnam. Well, North Vietnamese couldn't do anything about it, but they did have some personnel infiltrated into the region. That's the invasion of Laos by North Vietnam. Uh, lots of stuff like this. Mm. It's very striking. It's very striking. There were a few American reporters, I should say, who did work on it. Mm -hmm. Greenwood, Newsweek correspondent, a couple of mm. others. You're, you're absolutely right, uh, Professor. Um, you know, I know that the media landscape uh, back then is so different from what it is today. Um, I just want to share with you uh, what just happened this month, right? Like everything that you've just talked about happened in the 60s and 70s. Um, so to the average American, that's history, right? Like, why does it matter now? Well, we just learned that on February 4th, five children were walking home from school and they stumble upon this, you know, which looks to a child like a ball, you know, to what you mentioned earlier. So they started throwing this around and an explosion happened. Two children, um, both of them boys, ages six and seven were killed immediately and three are severely injured. This just happened this month. Now, um, despite all of our best efforts, right? Like legacies of war and everyone who is pushing for this issue to be resolved. Um, events like this still happen to this day. Um, this one in particular happened in Vientiane province, which you mentioned is the, the capital province, right? And it's not a high priority clearance area. So it has limited resources. Um, events like this does not garner huge media attention. Why do you think this is the case? And if something like this happened in France or the UK or here in our own country, what do you think the public's reaction would be? It's easy to determine. This is not the only case. Uh, it's not only children playing. A farmer can be working in the field. A hoe can hit one of these things. Everything blows up and these pellets go all over the place, killing anyone who's around. Now, there was a British mining, demining group that was working for a while, trying to clear up uh, this area. The US wouldn't do anything. Finally, the US provided pittance of money to do something. That's about it. But this is not the only case. It's uniform. Let's take a case we all know about, 9-11. Mm -hmm. Everybody heard about 9-11. Change the world. Okay. Let's look for a minute at 9-11. Actually, it was the second 9-11. There was another 9-11, which is well known in South America. 9-11, 1973. Okay, what happened on September 11th, 1973? Uh, there was a military coup in Chile orchestrated 
basically run by the United States, which overthrew the parliamentary regime, which had been an enemy of the United States, social democratic Allende regime. The US had been had done everything possible to overthrow the regime. The CIA was involved, everyone couldn't manage. Finally, there was a military coup. 9-11, 1973, what happened? Well, let's put it in per capita equivalents to make it compare with the United States. It's as if on our 9-11, uh, 30,000 people were killed, uh, 500,000 tortured, uh, government overthrown, uh, a regime of terror and violence was installed in the United States. Mm -hmm. Would that have made the newspapers? If it had happened here, yeah. That's what happened in Chile on 9-11 and we did it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, nobody knows. If you ask somebody, what's the first 9-11, who, who would even hear about it? That's normal. Mm -hmm. The US is just taking over traditional imperial uh, uh, culture, which suppresses all of your own atrocities and highlights the ones by others. Mm. Actually, it was quite striking in the late 70s. I wrote about it a lot. There were two huge atrocities going on in the late 70s. Same area of the world, Southeast Asia, right. roughly comparable in per capita scale. One was Cambodia, Khmer Rouge. Other was the Indonesian invasion of East Timor. Uh, probably the closest to true genocide in the post Second World War period. Uh, same, there was one fundamental difference between them. In the case of Cambodia, you could blame it on someone else and there's nothing we could do about it. Mm -hmm. No one had even a, a hint about what we could do. Case of East Timor, you can blame it on yourself because the US was responsible for it. And you could have called it off in a minute. In fact, that was proven later when under a lot of pressure, 20 years later, Clinton finally was forced to call it off. Just told the Indonesian generals it's over, it was over. Okay, two different, and that's, the fundamental difference. Two major atrocities, same area, same time. One, our responsibility could easily call it off, unknown. It was a major effort to try to get any attention to it. 20 years of work before you get anyone to even look at it. The other, you could blame it on somebody else, nothing we could do about it. Major event, huge event. Actually, Ed Herman and I covered the media on this. In both cases, there was enormous lying. In the case of East Timor, it was denial, denial of what was happening, lying. In the case of Cambodia, it was horrible enough, but enormous lying to try to maximize it. Well, uh, I think I've lost you. Oh, I'm here, sorry. Are you still there? Okay, yeah. that's, it's normal. So you go back to your question. Yes, if there was a, I say if uh, Iran had placed cluster bombs in the United States and children were being murdered, we'd probably nuke them. But you certainly know about it. When it's something we did in Laos, who cares? It's way out there, not of interest. Are there anything that we can do as activists to change that? Um, you know, to to really ins encourage more media coverage of events such as this. Sorry, I didn't hear. Are there things that activists can do to encourage do? more media to, to give more attention to this? Oh, amazing. Take Fred Branson. I mean, almost single-handedly, he broke through the almost total silence on this. Not total, but almost nothing. Mm. He did amazing work. First of all, while he was in Laos, getting people to see and understand it the way he did with me, but also he was finally kicked out of Laos. He came back to the United States, got involved in organizing here, did an amazing job of, uh, uh, pose, of organizing opposition, not only to Laos, but to the Indochina war, later other things. 
an amazing person the rest of his life too. He died unfortunately very early, but it was a, a, one person. Let's take East Timor. There actually is a person very much like Fred. I, in fact, I often mix them up. They even look sort of like <laughs> Arnold Cohen. He is almost single-handedly responsible for the fact that people know about the horrendous atrocities in East Timor and for the fact that finally it was able to develop opposition to it. Actually, I met him early on, pretty much the way I met. Uh, he was a graduate student at uh, Cornell University. When the East Timor invasion occurred, he knew about it. And he dropped out of school. He started working on it and spent the, most of the rest of his life on it. He's, he's luckily still alive doing other great things. But he was the person who, again, maybe there were a handful of others there were, but he was the main person who got me. I found out about it from him. Others did. Uh, then finally, after lots of work, enormous work, uh, he, uh, there was a substantial popular opposition. There always was in Australia. They were very close by. They knew about it, mm -hmm. but not, not in the West. Uh, the, but for, uh, Arnold, a couple of others, we worked really hard on it. Finally, it got to the point where uh, uh, Arnold was able to get powerful elements of the Catholic Church. It was a Catholic country interested in it. They put pressure on Clinton. There was by then large po popular opposition. Mm. And Clinton finally uh, agreed to call the war off like that. Could have been done 25 years earlier. He basically told the Indonesian military said, we're never going to leave. It's our territory. We we're going to keep it. Clinton wow. said, it's over. They left next day. U.S. is a powerful country, mm -hmm. a lot of things. Uh, the U.S. lays down the law, others obey. Uh, we could have stopped it right away. No interest. Take a look at the commentary on it today. It's astonishing. Uh, no, take it's, Samantha it's... Power, who's the uh, humanitarian specialist in the administration. She has a book called uh, uh, Problems from Hell. The book is about how the United States failed to deal with atrocities of others. Mm. Yeah, a lot of work on atrocities of others and how we failed to deal with it. She mentions East Timor in a phrase, said in East Timor, we looked away. That was our error. We didn't look away. We looked right there, provided the arms, provided a green light for the invasion, supported it all the way through, in fact, her predecessor at the United Nations, Daniel Moynihan, highly regarded as a great uh, exponent of national international law, great moralist. He was the UN ambassador mm -hmm. when Indonesia invaded. His memoirs describe it. He takes pride in the fact that he was able to, as he puts it, render the United Nations utterly incapable of doing anything to respond to the invasion. He then points out on the side, by that time, a couple months later, 60,000 people had been killed. But we were, he was successful in preventing the UN from doing anything in response because it was a US action. All there, it's all in the records, but mm -hmm. we looked away from the leading humanitarian. Uh, that's what it means to be immersed in an imperial culture. You go to France, you go to your England, exactly the same. It just happened in France, in fact. It was just a plea to get France to offer some apology for its horrendous atrocities in Algeria going back to the 19th century. Macron government said, absolutely not. Not only do we offer any help, you don't even get an apology. That's mm -hmm. France, peak of civilization. England, the same. Uh, the atrocities are barely known. They're barely coming, to, beginning to be known. Part of the general activism in the countries, popular activism, has brought many of these things to the fore. Now, a lot of stuff is coming out that was suppressed for centuries. Now, take the United States. 
up until the 1960s, the leading American anthropologists were saying that the nat what's called the national territory uh, didn't have had practically no people, just a few stragglers, yeah. hunter gatherers straggling around. Well, they were off by maybe 10 million or so. Uh, they were cultivated. They were advanced civilizations, large cities, trading all the way through the continent, mm -hmm. uh, wiped out, exterminated, didn't happen. Well, thank goodness for, for, for activists, right? Um, I, I just want to shift a little bit since I know we're running out of time um, to just more of the solution, right? Uh, we talked a lot about what happened and all the problems. Um, I want to ask you um, to something a little bit more relevant that we could possibly do as a country. So Laos is the most heavily bombed country per capita due to the extensive use of cluster munitions which we just talked about. The majority of the world has now banned this weapon through the Convention on Cluster Munitions um, with the government of Laos leading the way for the international treaty. Why should the US join the world in this treaty? And do you think this can actually happen in the next four year under this administration? If you press for it. If there's no pressure, no. If there's no pressure, you keep to the imperialist norm we can do anything we like and it didn't happen maybe we failed somewhere because uh, we didn't get our maximum goals that's imperial mentality deeply rooted in the united states nothing new all of its predecessors are the same or you can press for opening up the reality of the world and the reality of history to the general population and i think you'll kind of get the reaction of the polls in 1975. Fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake, and we should stop doing it. Actually, we're doing it right now. Take the war in Yemen. It's being fought with American arms, American intelligence. It's the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. It doesn't have to happen, okay? You can stop it, like you can stop other things. You can remember the past and do something about it. You can deal with the legacy of the past. So in Laos, the place is littered with bombs. The least we can do, absolute least, is get rid of them. Actually, we owe enormous reparations to Laos for what we did to it. That would be the next step in moving up to becoming a civilized society. That's a long way off. We have similar problems right at home. Right, right, thank you. Um, so we will keep pushing for it. Now, given your extensive background in computer science and artificial intelligence, what role do you think AI will have in resolving the UXO issue in Laos and the broader Southeast Asia? Can you give us any examples of technologies that we can use to speed up the clearance process? Well, the, the obvious technology is demining technology. We certainly can do that. That's known technology. Can it be done more efficiently? Probably. Here you could imagine using the techniques of artificial intelligence, other high um, intense uh, computer-based systems to improve the way it's done, do it effectively, and also to help carry out humane programs. Uh, AI is not magic, it's another technology. And technologies themselves are typically pretty neutral they don't have any consequences. Some are different, but most technology you can use for good, you can use for harm, like a hammer. You can, a torturer can use a hammer to smash somebody's skull in. Somebody else can use a hammer to build a house. You know, mm -hmm. the, the hammer doesn't care. Same with AI. You can use it for automated weapon systems, which will make killing better, may destroy us all if we make the insane decision to automate our uh, response systems to nuclear weapons. They'll make mistakes, we'll all be gone. Uh, it's happened over and over, human intervention has stopped it. Very dangerous. You can use AI for destruction of human life on earth. You can use it for beneficial aims. That's up to you, up to me, up to other people. We decide how the technology is gonna be used. Mm -hmm. and we can find ways to use it for 
beneficial purposes. Right, right. Well, if you hear of anything um, that may be able to help us, you know, as, as we work with our demining partners um, in, in just making it safer um, for humans to start the demining efforts, we'd love to hear more about that. Um, so I have two more questions um, before we close. Um, you've had a long and extraordinary career. Um, when you look back at past successes, uh, specifically cases in which there were positive changes that were made through activism, what lessons do you draw for future activists? Well, the lessons I draw are that there are people like you who care about these things and are willing to do something about it. And that's the hope for the future of human society. If there aren't people like you who are willing to engage, we're lost. But there are, and they've done amazing things. I mentioned people like Fred Branson and Arnold mm -hmm. Cohen, but there are plenty of others who are unknown, working on the ground, working effectively. They're the ones who make history work, make progress and so on. And the lesson is, let's find more of them. Let's encourage more to join them. That's the main lesson. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, a follow up to that is, what's your secret to such a meaningful life? <laughs> What, what's your secret to such a meaningful life? Um, what do you do? <laughs> Can't hear it. Um, your secret to a meaningful life. A long and meaningful life. What is your secret? The secret for a long life? The bicycle theory. If you keep <laughs> riding fast, you don't fall off. <laughs> and my, my wife, who keeps me alive. She not only fixes my computer when it doesn't work, but she also <laughs> keeps me alive and healthy. That's a that's an important fact in life. Oh, sure. thank you, thank you for that. Um, you know, my my final question here is um, qu quite a selfish one for us here at Legacies. Um, our goal is to resolve the UXO issue in Laos, um, hopefully within our lifetime. Um, do you have any advice for our team here at Legacies of War um, or, you know, for me specifically? The only kinds of advice I know are truisms, basically, things we all know. We know what kind of work has to be done. It's not easy, it takes thought, it takes commitment, it takes courage, but there's no magic keys, there's no secrets. The things we know have to be done. We have to find out ways to do them. That's the only advice. There's no general rules. Well, thank you. We would definitely keep turning the pages towards hope and trying to find a solution. Appreciate your time and being with, with us here today um, and stay connected. Thank you. Thank you.